Welcome to The Hair Loss Show. Dr. Russell Knudsen and Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash discuss issues relating to hair loss and the medical and surgical treatment of hair loss in both men and women. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Hair Loss Show, episode 83. My name is Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash. I'm Dr. Russell Knudsen. Welcome. Right, and today we're going to go through a couple of questions uh, that have been sent through to the channel. We thought we'd, uh, we've been asked this in, in a variety of different uh, manners, so we thought we'd just go through that. And really, um, very straightforward, but let's, let's go through the questions. They're generally about finasteride. Uh, the first question is, if you go for a higher dose and come back on a low dose after a while, would you lose ground on finasteride? So that's basically someone's taking, for example, a milligram a day, and they're stabilizing their hair loss, and then they decide to go down to three milligrams a week, which is what we generally is our starting dose, are they gonna lose ground? Okay, well, this happens all the time in our practice because as you've probably heard from our other episodes, we rarely prescribe seven milligrams a week. So we often have patients come to us either on seven milligrams a week or almost nine milligrams a week because they're taking seven lots of a quarter of a five milligram tablet, which if it was accurate, would be 8.75 milligrams, which in my opinion is way too much. So remember the key factor here is how long the finasteride stays in the body, which is much longer than a day. So that's the reason we do believe in microdosing and customized dosing, that people are gonna respond differently to it. But in general, uh, we have not seen any deterioration in the quality of people go from seven milligrams, for example, down to three milligrams. Mm. Now, that said, that's not a black and white rule over time, because if you look at the original trials with the one milligram per day, at one year, 86% of people were stable, at two years, it was 83%, at five years, it was 64%. That's not the drug stopping working, that just means that it slowed them down without necessarily stopping it in its tracks. So we don't have a cure. Right. So basically, you've got to understand that for some people, there's a bit of leakage, but I still think a 64% hit rate at five years in is a pretty good hit rate. So generally speaking, that would also be true in our experience. Uh, those same 64% of people would be fine at five years using three milligrams a week, using seven milligrams a week. You're either completely blocked or you're not. Um, it may be the figures are something like 50% at 10 years. It's hard to know. Yes. But if you uh, are using um, uh, finasteride at a higher dose and want to come to a lower dose, in our opinion, um, as long as you're using a, a reasonable amount, that's not a half a milligram a week, for example, or a milligram a week, as long as you're using two or three milligrams a week, you should be fine. Now, even though this question is about finasteride, it's an, it's an interesting question that also applies to minoxidil. Because what we discovered over time, uh, the first product into the marketplace for minoxidil was 2%. Mm -hmm. And then they bought in a 5% because uh, the 5% is, a, uh, well, obviously it's a stronger dose, but it also has a more stimulatory effect. But what they found over time that there is, the end result wasn't necessarily better. You just got to the end result faster if you used the 5%, which raises the possibility uh, that for many patients who are effectively on 5%, um, that they could then swap down to 2% later on. This has been proven to be true for many patients. They could swap down to 2% um, uh, after a while and still maintain the effect because they've got the full effect and now you're just maintaining the effect and you don't need as much to do it. So for people that again, that are looking to minimize the amount of medicine in their system, it's feasible that if you've got a good response in the first year on 5% and you're happy with that, it is feasible that you could use 2% and maintain that benefit. So that's interesting. So let's, but let's go back to finasteride because there's a couple of points that you, you raised that I want to unpack a little bit more, which was, first of all, is this concept of uh, half-life, all right? Because some of the sometimes I get people asking, oh, listen, I don't understand. You know, you say one milligram three times a week because, you know, it lasts that length of time in the system. But then, hang on, if I look up the data for finasteride, the half-life is only eight hours. And there's a difference between that because what, we're, what that means is that the level of finasteride in the bloodstream drops by half at eight hours. But that's pointless because it doesn't matter what the level is in the bloodstream. It's what the effect is on the enzyme, on the 5-alpha reductase. In the hair follicle. Correct. So that is longer lasting. Yeah, well, that, that's the original data was published 
when they released the medicine in 1998, and they were very careful to hide that data after that for, for reasons I'm not sure. But um, you know, the, the, the data originally that I saw suggested that the half-life was 30 days, meaning that the, the tissue level of finasteride dropped to half its, its peak level after 30 days in the system. That's after a single dose, by the way. So if we, if we say, look, testosterone gets converted into uh, dihydrotestosterone uh, by the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, what we're saying is that finasteride, what it's doing is it's blocking that enzyme. What it's, not, what it's doing essentially is making it inactive. And one tablet is effectively making that molecule of that enzyme inactive for 30 days. Now, it's, there are multiple enzymes in the body, so it's not well, just one. It's not one just, dose. but uh, the other, and the other issue, of course, is that ends, it, it might be effectively a permanent block of that particular enzyme, but the body makes new enzymes yes. all the time. And that's a critical factor so that you understand why you should take it more frequently than once every 30 days. So your body is continually making uh, enzymes. So you should see the finasteroids mopping up new enzymes, taking them out of action. And that's really, what, that's really what the whole goal of the therapy is, to take the enzymes out of action. Now, finasteride takes about two thirds of the 5-alpha reductase out of action. So for some people who haven't got very elevated levels of enzymic activity in the hair, that two thirds block is enough to keep them happy at Correct. five years, for example. That's just 64% of people at five years that are still stable. Which is the. But, but if you have the higher level of enzyme and the two third drop doesn't take you down quite far enough, um, that's the people are still leaking slowly. Yes. Um, the, the but it, it, it raises a point that we're not trying, the goal of therapy is not to try and bring this down to zero. No. <clears throat> you know, we're not trying no, because, to. Because again, once you do that, once you bring it down to zero, potentially you can have other effects in Correct. the system. Yeah. And we're really trying to treat the hair, not to obliterate the whole system. So it's about getting that threshold yeah. level. The sweet spot. Correct. Which is individual for one person as it is for, which for is the Which is why next we talk about customised dose. Correct, yes. So it's about finding that, that right dose. But it's, uh, you know, half-life is important, but not necessarily in the case of, you know, why you don't, that's why you don't need to take the drug every eight hours, for example, because Correct. you're not worried about what the blood level if is. The, if the half-life blood level f was for an antibiotic at eight hours, you'd be taking it three, hour, three yes. times a day. That would be your three times a day antibiotic. Um, and that's clearly not the way finasteride was ever prescribed. So the prescribing frequency has never been related to the blood uh, level. Good. Right, that's good. So that answers that question. That's only the first one. All right, so let's look at the next one, which is, um, this is a very interesting, tricky one. I really want to know uh, that if I apply Avidoc capsules topically, will it work and regrow hair as a topical deuteristride without side effects? So we've talked about uh, topical finasteride. This is, this is um, referring to topical deuteristride but more so about taking Avidoc capsules and applying it uh, topically. Now, I've had this question a few times about people making up their own uh, topical medications using uh, oral medications. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Look, we, you know that if you're using finasteride, which doesn't come as a gel uh, capsule with liquid inside it, that you're not going to be able to do this without dissolving it in the solvent yes. uh, and then getting a concentration. Uh, because the um, deuteristride comes as a liquid-filled gel capsule, the theory of the patients, of course, is that they just prick open um, the deuteristride, apply it to the scalp, and uh, it, it, it absorbs down to the hair follicle and does its thing. And because it's not being absorbed internally, it's not going through the body and therefore it's not going to create side effects. That's the theory. Now, the two problems with the theory are this. Number one, is that the formulation inside the capsule is meant to survive the gastrointestinal tract, not to be absorbed through the skin. Mm -hmm. And the skin has a very specific filtration system for allowing molecule size in. So this is one of the, the um, magical uh, developments uh, for topical therapies over the years, is being able to find a way to get through what we call the skin barrier, to get an active ingredient that is a large molecular size in through what, for want of a better word, is the sieve of the skin that protects uh, from large molecules getting in. So there's no guarantee that pricking open a capsule in the formulation that you've got of your deuteristride is even going to be significantly absorbed because of the molecular size of what's inside yes. the capsule. 
That's the first thing to do. The second thing is that when we're carrying medicines across the skin, we normally use um, agents that are known to facilitate absorption. And that's not, again, going to be in a gel filled capsule. So my general advice, uh, firstly, for the first part of the question is don't prick open a capsule and expect it to work. Secondly, even if you've got uh, topical jutasteride compounded, our experience with finasteride suggests that if you were a patient who had used oral finasteride, got side effects, and went to topical finasteride, most of those patients would still get side effects. Yes, because it still has to be absorbed, goes to the liver. Well, some of it inevitably gets into the bloodstream. Yeah. So I'm going to presume, without being able to give you chapter and verse, that the same is going to be true for jutasteride. Yes. But that's still how it's going to be effective because it has to be uh, metabolized in order to, uh, and the active metabolite of that to, to, to have its effect. So I would strongly discourage people to take things into their own hand and experiment yes. with these things. Get it made up properly and then you'll probably find it be more effective that way. But also don't think that topical uh, therapy with either finasteride or jutasteride mm -hmm. gets you around the potential problem of side effects. If you're a person that's going to react it still appears to happen um, even with low dose uh, percentage topical yes. finasteride and jutasteride. Good. Well, I think that's good. That, that answers those questions. I hope you found that useful. Thanks very much watch, uh, for watching. Please remember to, to like and subscribe to the channel and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. See you then. Take care.